how do you get to surgeons? How do you decide that's the appropriate option for you? And that this this is a, a chart that I saw in the European guidelines for treatment of Graves disease. It's, it's fairly simple, which is appropriate for surgeons and to the point. And you can see the mainstay of treatment, of course, is antithyroid treatment, as Dr. Kahn said. That's really what you have to try first. There are very extenuating circumstances where surgical treatment becomes the mainstay at the beginning. And one of those things is if the patient has a nodule that is overactive, and that's not Graves' disease, right? And that's surgical treatment or medications. But more importantly, if they have a nodule that potentially can have a cancerous process going in there, a malignancy in there, so concurrently, you're treating both the Graves condition, the thyroid aspect of the Graves condition, as well as treating a, a nodule that's hazardous, and taking that and removing that as well. So, but the majority of times when patients come in, and oftentimes the patients will go see an endocrinologist and will come and see a surgeon because this is a, a strange disease that they say. It's hard to comprehend what's going on. Most patients want to explore all their options before deciding which path to take. And oftentimes my job is to kind of take them off the ledge of doing surgery as the first option, but rather exploring the non-surgical options first, seeing what those options can provide for them, because they're obviously less risky right, for most patients. And uh, majority of the patients that, uh, that come to me and ultimately require surgeries are patients who've had medical treatment and have failed medical treatment or are unable to tolerate it. I'd say, I'd say probably that is the most common type of patients, patients who have allergies to these medications or develop allergies in time to antithyroid medications or an intolerance for them, potentially developing some of those other side effects that are exceedingly rare. And then they have no option besides either getting radioactive iodine or surgical treatment. And radioactive iodine has its own inherent issues and thyroid surgery of, of course has its own surgery issues as well. So let me let me do a little bit of anatomy now before we get to the complications and potential risks. So us surgeons are less intellectual than the endocrinologists. We're more of a comic book type of characters and so very visual in nature. So let me sh let me just show you this. Uh, so the thyroid gland works in this fashion. So the gland in the brain, the pituitary gland, produces TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, which comes down and stimulates the thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormones, right? And so that TSH receptor inside the thyroid gland is the subject of this disease, of course, the target of this disease. So when the immune system produces an antibody towards that target, it falsely tells the gland to become overactive. It activates the gland, it stimulates the receptor, the gland produces hormone and higher amounts of hormone. So in a hyperthyroid state, what you have is a gland that now is producing a lot more hormone, but it's not getting the TSH stimulation from the pituitary gland. It's getting it from the antibody, right? And so this gland, just like Dr. Cohen said, is a subject, is the victim of this disease, just as the eye and other organs become the victim of this disease as well. And so the TSH receptor is the target of the antibody and so removing the thyroid gland is one option in treating this disease because then you remove that target. Right? But it's not the only treatment. Now looking at the details of the gland itself anatomically speaking. So this is the thyroid gland. Thyroid is a very interesting organ in terms of embryology. <clears throat> it develops in the back of the tongue, up here, and then it descends down. And that's why you see this trail. This is a trail of that descent, a tract of it coming down. And once it comes down here, it rests on both sides of the breathing tube. And let me show you the breathing tube in a different color. So this is the breathing tube here, the trachea. And above it is the voice box. This is the Adam's apple right there. So the thyroid is sitting on the breathing tube, on the voice box to some extent. Now when you turn the thyroid around, what you're going to see are more important structures. This is the back side of the voice box. right? This is the top of the esophagus going down, leading to your stomach. So the 
po posterior portion of the thyroid gland rests against your swallowing tube, the esophagus. And right behind it are also four very vital organs called the parathyroids. Their job is to control the level of calcium in your bloodstream. That's their main job. A little bit affected by vitamin D levels, but mostly calcium levels, right? In interestingly, we only need one parathyroid gland to function properly, but we have four of them. Probably evolutionarily speaking, because the thyroid is so prone to diseases and tumors and inflammatory processes, we've developed backups so that we could prevent, if one or two of these get knocked out by any of those diseases, you still have. Because your body cannot tolerate not having a parathyroid gland. Because if your level of calcium in your bloodstream is not regulated, pretty much every cell in your body and every organ in your body will fail to function. Because it's part of the messenger system in every organ. Right? Nerves function by changing calcium levels to pass on a message to the next nerve or muscle. So it works in every part of the body. So these glands are extremely important. Right? Another thing that's really important is the vocal cord nerve. So the vocal cord nerve comes out of your brain, goes down into your chest, wraps around the vessels around in your chest, and then comes up to go into your voice box. So it's on the back side of the fire gland, on both sides. It does the same thing on both sides, right? On the left side, it goes all the way down to the aorta, so it goes even up lower to make its loop. On the right side, it goes around the blood vessels that go to your arm, so less of a route to take to get to the final destination. So these are the important anatomical findings as it relates to surgical treatment of the thyroid, right? So when you're doing a thyroidectomy, let's go back to the front view, and you're removing a thyroid, what you have to do is make sure you find the nerve and protect it. Make sure you find the parathyroid glands and protect them. And protecting the parathyroid glands doesn't mean just finding them, but rather finding them and finding the blood vessels that are feeding them. Those tiny little capillaries that you see, right? So just finding the gland alone is not gonna it's not gonna do the job. It's finding them, making sure that blood vessels are there that are feeding them. And if you see that you have a parathyroid where the blood vessels could not be preserved, then you can take out the parathyroid gland cut it into tiny little pieces and insert it in the muscle either in your neck or somewhere else in the body, but usually the muscle right there in the neck because you're, you're immediately there, right? And the majority of times, 80% of the times, if you do a transplantation of one parathyroid gland, it will take, right? And if you want to improve that number, if you reimplant two parathyroid glands in two separate muscles, you improve that by up to 97% of the time you can get those glands to function. Yes? Correct. But wow. all four are functioning at all times. It's not that one is the main one and the other ones are backups. All of them are functioning at, at all times. But if you were to only have one, that would be adequate enough to do the job and manage your calcium levels. Because you don't know the statuses of all of them while looking at them. When you remove and you have four visual parathyroid glands, right? you're not certain that all four are functioning or getting enough blood flow. right? So you. The, you know, the experience with surgery comes with that, that you can visually see these glands and say, okay, I've been, been three hours into this surgery, these two glands look like they're getting good vascularity and good blood flow, I think they're safe, and these two look a little darker perhaps. They're getting some venous congestion, their blood flow is not as good as it should be, I'm going to take these two out and transplant them into an arm. I'm not sure the other two that are resting in place are going to function properly or not, I'm going to do this as backup just in case. We're always trying to increase the certainty for the patients, you know, to improve the odds that they're going to have normal functioning without needing additional help. Uh, you trust the body and how it works better than you would trust with medications and external factors to try to improve. It's possible, but when you get a transplantation from someone else, you have to take immune medications to suppress your immune system, right? And so it's it's only been done in patients who have had kidney transplants at the same time as getting, you know, so they have kidney failure, their parathyroids become overfunctional because they're, they're because of the complications of hemodialysis, long-term hemodialysis, and so on. And so they have a parathyroidectomy, and all four parathyroid glands are removed, or three and a half are removed, but the half that's left behind doesn't function properly, and this patient is left without a functioning parathyroid all their life. So 
the only reports of transplantation is in these patients because they get a kidney transplant, they have to take immunosuppressive medications anyways. Doing a transplantation of a parathyroid gland may make sense, may seem appropriate because you're not going to give additional medications, they're already on it. Because that nerve comes down, let me draw it in a bit different color, because that nerve comes down and it goes behind the thyroid to get to its final destination, the voice box, when you have a thyroid gland that's getting larger, and also getting inflamed, right, because of the inflammatory process that's going on, that can affect the functioning of the nerve. So, you know, these nerves are very thin, they're like a thin spaghetti, right? And, but within that thin spaghetti, there's millions of fibers going to multiple muscles, these tiny little muscles you see here, one of them, but there's many more inside the voice box that modulate the movement of the vocal cords. Okay, let me, sh let me show you how the vocal cords function also. That will help. This is the vocal cord right down there. This line right down there is the vocal cord sitting on top of the breathing tube. Let me show you that here. So there you go. This line right there is the vocal cord sitting on top of the breathing tube, right? And so when you look from above at, at the vocal cord, it looks something like this. So when you speak, when you say E, And then when you breathe, they open up for air to pass through, okay? So the movement of that vocal cord is fine-tuned by multiple small muscles. Now when you change pitch, what you do is one muscle stretches the vocal cord. So as you go to a higher register, the vocal cords are getting stretched out by a few muscles, right? And so Singers exercise, and when they practice and do voice lessons, they're exercising these muscles so they can get to different pitches at different times and being able to finally control that. So there's a lot of fibers, millions of fibers in this tiny noodle, right, going to multiple muscles. And so when you have inflammation and pressure on this nerve, it's not going to function properly, so the voice changes. You're not able to reach the higher registers. Your voice breaks more, more easily. And so that's part of the problem with Graves' disease. Because you don't only get enlargement, you don't get the antibody just stimulating the gland to get big, but you also have an immune reaction, an inflammatory reaction, which is why Dr. Pram was saying, oftentimes we get patients who have Graves' disease, and then over the long term, they'll have low functioning gland. Because that inflammation eats up the normal functioning of the thyroid gland, so in time. So that inflammation is what affects the nerves and then someone who has an active Graves' disease. When you're doing surgery for a forward thyroid gland, we oftentimes use a breathing tube that goes into the breathing apparatus, right? That has monitors on the vocal cords itself. So any electrical stimulation or any kind of stimulation of the nerve going to the vocal cords will be picked up by this monitor, right? And so when we go in, the first thing we do is we come down here and bring the thyroid back come down here and you check the nerve right at this point. You find the nerve at the lower location where there is no thyroid sitting on it. And then you track it up and go behind the thyroid and see it go into the voice box. Once you have the whole nerve tracked out, then you have a safer surgery. Right? Then the next thing you do here is you find the parathyroid. So you essentially lift the thyroid gland and get underneath and look behind it and look for the parathyroid. Let's flip the thyroid around. 80% of the time, these parathyroids are exactly in these locations that you see, right behind the thyroid. Interestingly enough, parathyroids also develop in, in the throat, underneath the tonsil. Pouches form that end up becoming parathyroids, and then they descend and come down. So the location, the final resting location of these parathyroids, 80% of the time is certain. It's behind the thyroid hood. 20% of the time it's not. They can stay up here, and they can overshoot and go all the way down in the chest, right? So in the case of Graves' disease, the patients who don't have the usual location, when they have a parathyroid gland further lower, maybe in, even in the chest, are actually more fortunate because the surgery is not going to affect that gland or the blood vessels feeding the gland. You know, when you are doing Graves' disease, what you're doing is you're going in there and removing all of the thyroid gland, right? That's the objective, to not to leave any target there for the immune reactivity, right? And so when you're doing that, 
it's not like a cancer where you not only need to remove the gland and be sure to get everything around it so the little legs of cancer are not around. You're just trying to remove the target, right? So you can get into the capsule of the thyroid gland. And that's sometimes where the parathyroid sit inside the capsule and the blood vessels are on the surface of that capsule. So you get into the capsule, separate the capsule where the parathyroids are, remove the thyroid and leave the capsule behind, right? Now, that's easy to do for a thyroid that's not inflamed, but as the thyroid gets bigger and more inflamed, it becomes more challenging, right? And so when you're doing that, you could lose the blood vessel as the thyroid is bigger and more inflamed. Keeping and maintaining the blood vessel, feeding those parathyroid will become harder. And so as the bigger the thyroid gland is, not only is the surgery more challenging, you have to consider re-implanting the parathyroids more. And so, you know, what, what they say is that a thyroidectomy is best done by a surgeon who does a minimum of 50 thyroid surgeries a year, because they're the doctors who are going to have enough experience preserving the important function of there. Removing a thyroid itself is not difficult. It's preserving all the important things around it that's challenging in every kind of thyroid, especially, especially in grave disease. Right? So, any questions about this anatomical stuff? Uh, probably, yeah. I do parathyroid and thyroid surgery, right? Tumors and stuff, and I do probably over 100, 150 a year. I do a fair amount. <clears throat> Just the nature of the practice ends up being that way. They tend to have more scarring around there, so the surgery becomes a bit more challenging, and it's variable. Sometimes you go in there and you're surprised there's really no inflammation at all, despite the fact that they got radioactive iodine. And sometimes there's dense scarring. And again, it all has to do with the immune reaction to the radioactive iodine. You know, just like Tom was saying, you know, some people will get radioactive iodine, it won't affect their eye. And some people really does affect the eye. It's, it's again your immune system that really dictates how that's going to proceed. But majority of times, uh, you can do a safe surgery despite that. You just have to take extra precautions. You have the nerve monitors. You re you're more likely to re-implant parathyroids to, to make sure that they have normal functioning parathyroids ultimately. But it's very doable. You re-implant them in muscle. Okay? You, you chop them up into little pieces, and you make a pocket in the muscle, this muscle, and I call it the sternocleidomastoid muscle, because it has a lot of vascularity, because you want blood vessels to grow into this transplanted parathyroid. So if you take two parathyroids out, you make one pocket on this side and one pocket on the opposite side, maximizing the potential for growth of blood vessels and survival.